Hey you guys, Matt Allen here. Welcome back to Tactical Bassin. Today we're talking about catching giant bass. We're not talking about numbers. We're talking about those fish of a lifetime. We're talking fall and winter. During that cold water period, some of the biggest bass in the lake are vulnerable and you can catch them. We're going to talk about the baits, the techniques, the places to look to catch that fish of a lifetime, that new personal best how to catch a giant. So many anglers focus on the pre-spawn, that early spring period where bass are all bulked up to come up into the shallows and spawn. That's when anglers focus on trying to catch big bass. As a result, Oftentimes, giant bass are left completely alone in the fall. Anglers are off hunting, they've winterized their boats, those bass are just totally left to themselves, and the true giants are bulking up for winter, and they become incredibly predictable. They're susceptible to swim baits and other approaches. You can catch them. So today I want to focus on the areas and then the specific techniques. We're going to talk about how to adapt it as the water temperature changes, as it gets colder, what you need to do to stay with these fish. But I'm telling you, some of the biggest bass of the entire year are caught now, late fall into winter, November, December. As anglers are giving up and going home, it's prime time to catch these monster fish. So before the water gets too cold, you have a lot of options. You can catch them on a variety of baits. You can catch them on hard baits. You can catch them on boot tail soft baits. You can catch them on wedge tail style soft baits. You've got so many different options to catch these fish. As the water cools, your options begin to narrow. But first, let's talk about where you need to be looking. We already covered this. See, most of what we do at Tactical Bassin is directed towards helping you catch more fish, just in general, just catch more fish, have more fun on the water. But you know that where we came from is targeting giant fish. That's what we love to do. Tim and I are passionate about it. When we go out on our own, we target giant bass, giant smallmouth, giant spots, giant largemouth, giant striper. It doesn't matter. We love catching big, big fish. Today, I want to help you do the same thing because it's not as complicated as you think. So last week we did that video, where do bass go during the fall to winter transition? And I explained to you that they're heading to those deeper water haunts, those areas where you've got long points that break off to deep water rocky outcrops, ledges, bluff walls. Those deep water, hard rock structures are where the fish will tend to bunch up. I also explained that a lot of species will pile up on these spots. That is a sure tell. If you've got multiple species grouping up on an area, you've got a big bass location. If you have other big predators showing up, if big catfish show up on a spot, big bass use the same place because predators are all doing the same thing. They're all hunting smaller fish. So if you can find one of those predators, odds are you found multiple predators. They may not feed at the same time. They don't like to compete with each other. The bass tend to give way to the more aggressive predators, but they use those spots. So identifying the spots is not that hard. Go out, fish normally. When you find those areas where bass seem to be consistently grouping up, big ones are going to be there too. That's when it's time to start adapting. Now, earlier in the fall, all the way up to where we are now, of course, if you're up north, you are farther along in the transition than guys in the south. And I tend to avoid speaking to specific water temperature because the variations, the times where one bait will work better than another bait, those transitions aren't necessarily water temperature driven. And even when they are, it's not the same in different parts of the country. The bass behave exactly the same, but the seasons shift at different speeds. So I hate to tell you a water temperature because if I tell you, a guy in one state will experience something different than a guy in another. So just know as the water is cooling, as it's going down, you will shift between these baits. So as you start seeing a bite tapering off, 
go to the next bait. Don't worry for me to, or don't wait for me to tell you that 42 degree water is the perfect temperature for the switch. Just go ahead and try it on your own. So as the water is on the warmer end, your hard baits are still going to work. Hard baits and then the more reactive, the harder thumping soft baits are both great options. And you can fish them faster than other baits, which is nice. You know, a bait like an Osprey, it's heavy, it tracks well, you can throw it out, let it go to the bottom, and then just start that medium or medium slow or slow retrieve. Any of those is gonna work. Just cover water in those areas where you know those bigger fish should be. The hard baits, I want you to focus on something very specific. That's why I grabbed these two. Both of these are baits that I would consider cover glides. So these are glide baits, single joint. They create a great S action going through the water. There's a big difference between the big giant custom glides that you might see out there on the internet and a glide bait that will work really well in and around cover. I actually wrote an article for FLW about this last year. A cover glide is a bait that is much more reactive in tight quarters. It has a tighter joint, typically a slightly smaller profile, something like an S-Waver 168 or 200 or that Storm Arashi. There are a couple of others, but all of these baits are extremely reactive, meaning when you work that rod, the baits do really erratic, really aggressive things. So as the water temps are still relatively high and you still have bait fish in the shallows and you still have bass eating those bait fish, reactive baits like this that are worked aggressively are incredible. You can catch giant fish up there in the shallows. As that water starts to cool, those fish will pull back out. We're going to start transitioning. But back to this, a cover glide versus an open water glide. I wanna make this perfectly clear because you see people all the time debating one glide bait over another. Which one is the best? There's not a best. There's a right bait for a scenario. Shallow water in and around cover, be it docks, laid down wood, rocky shoreline where the fish are down in the boulders, anything like that, hard structures where you can identify where the fish should be. A reactive glide bait is the very best choice. A smaller bait, tighter action. It doesn't have this giant sweeping five foot glide. That's not what you want. What you want is to take your glide bait, fish it slow. How many times have we talked to you guys about fishing an S waiver? Slow handle turns and then pump, pump. Get that bait to cut. What we're doing is we're triggering a reaction. If the fish are on identifiable structure, if I'm going down the bank and I see a dock pilings, I know that if I steadily swim up to the dock piling, the odds are that the bass is sitting near that piling. When I get near it, odds are the fish can see me. If I snap my reactive movement right then, odds are that bass will lash out and eat that bait. It's that simple. If I'm throwing one of these custom, expensive, multi-hundred dollar glide baits and I go to make my reactive movement and the bait shoots six feet away from the dock, odds are the fish will not shoot six feet after it and crush it. They may let it go. So there's a right bait for the job. Those bigger, larger, wider swimming glide baits, that is an open water tool. It will work better on long tapering points, humps, open water, clearer water, where the fish can see it from farther because that large movement has unbelievable drawing power. It will pull a fish so far to examine that bait. But you don't have that reactive movement like you can get out of your smaller baits and it will not work tight to cover nearly as well big open water where you need to pull them and draw them and they might come 10 or 15 or 20 or 100 feet when they see that thing in crystal clear water and they want to investigate. That's what those giant baits are for. Smaller baits, cover glides if you will, they're for the cover. They're for bait fish up shallow like we have right now. Now as that water starts cooling, 
And again, I'm not going to get into the specific temperatures, but as it's cooling down, you notice less bait fish in the shallows. You notice your shallow water bite is fading. Maybe your glide bait's not working anymore. You're throwing a faster moving bait. It's not really getting bit. Maybe you started creeping bottom and still got a few bites. Well, then your fish are probably making that move to the true winter haunts like we talked about in that other video. They're headed to that deeper, more stable water where they can gather with the bait fish and they'll stay steady throughout the entire winter. That's when it's time to start making your switch. You're going to abandon hard baits completely. Now, I'm not telling you they won't still work. I just want to play the odds with you today on catching the fish of a lifetime, catching that true giant as the water cools down. So we won't debate whether or not a bait can still get bit. We'll simply talk about your best option. Play the odds, work them in your favor. The colder that water gets, even the soft baits, the more rigid paddle tail style baits will start to go away. That's when you start switching to wedge tail style baits. Now, I'm gonna make a brief stop right here because I'm talking solely swim baits. I want you to know that you can also do this with other baits. It's all about changing your mentality and re-gearing to target larger than average fish. The swim bait just does it extremely well. So what I mean by that is the very last video we put out this before this one on Friday, Tim was talking about all the different finesse ways to catch fish. You can catch a ton of fish, and frankly, you can catch a giant fish finessing in winter. It works. Tim is very, very good at it. But what are the odds that a 12 or 13 or 14 pounder or a 10 pounder or a nine pounder is going to eat that little tiny bait when it comes by? They might be good. It just depends on the fish. But they're better with a bait that works better at targeting bigger fish, a jig or a swim bait or something of that nature, a meal that is hearty and worth eating for a big bass. So again, while my focus is entirely swim baits today, what I really want you doing large scale is focusing on bigger fish baits in general. So the next time you're on a Ned Rig bite, it might be worth picking up a jig or the next time you're on a drop shot bite, pick up a jig. Why? A jig is a bigger meal. It's generally slower moving, especially if you work it slower. And it's more likely than a Ned Rig to catch a 10 pounder, as an example. You're still out there on the water. You're still spending your time. It doesn't hurt to try to get that bigger bite. That's the actual mentality. So now let's jump right back into where I was. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear for you. Jumping back to the swim bait, and again, back to the swim bait, not because I think everybody that's watching this video wants to be a swim bait fisherman. Most people don't. It's work, the baits are heavy, it takes some dedicated gear to do it right. But if you're going to be out in the winter, why not be catching the absolute largest fish possible, right? Does that make sense? So that's the actual mindset here. Now let's jump back in. Wedge tail style baits will move in the coldest of temperatures. This style of tail will continue to pulse even when it is freezing cold. Paddle tail styles, they require a bait that will let that paddle move. It requires more water movement or a softer bait, with one exception. So this, this style bait, as the water gets colder, this is an Osprey, the colder and colder and colder that the water get, gets, the plastic will get more and more and more rigid. It becomes harder for that tail to kick as the plastic gets harder. The other style tail will continue to move really well. The exception to that rule is Little Creeper. Their baits, this is the, the eight inch All-American Trash Fish, this bait is just so soft. I mean, look at it. You see how floppy this thing is? You just roll it up in a ball. They are so soft that even when the water gets freezing cold and the bait gets more rigid, it's still soft enough to let that bait do its thing. This thing, if you just take it out and try and fast fish it, you will hate this bait because it's so soft that the tail will collapse and just sort of drag behind the bait. It's not what it's for. It's for that ultra slow bottom fishing. 
and that ultra slow bottom fishing will work in warmer water, but it will work even well, even better in that freezing cold water. The Little Creeper All-American Trash Fish will, and it comes in all kinds of sizes, right? There's the regular trash fish. This is the fatty trash fish. See how much bigger the belly section is? It's just a bulkier bait. And then that's the eight inch for comparison. Those baits are so soft that even in the coldest water, the bass will still eat them. So this is the one exception where I say, yes, I will still throw a paddle tail style in that cold winter water. Back to wedge tails. Wedge tails take the cake after that. Outside of that one bait, the wedge tail will take over because no matter how cold the water, no matter how cold the bait, no matter how deep you're fishing, how slow you're going, you can just be inching along. But when that bait hits a rock, that tail will, will sit back there and shimmy. And then it'll climb over that rock and it'll bump the next rock. And that tail will shimmy. And those fish just come out and eat it. Some of these baits too with these paddle tails, or with these, I keep saying paddle tails, wedge tails are very well balanced. The Huddleston has lead in the bottom, foam on top. Same with the mat lures, lead on the bottom, foam on top. These baits sit upright on the bottom. So you don't have to worry about ultra slow. Some baits, if you go ultra slow, they flop over. Well, these baits are designed to sit upright. Even at the slowest speeds when it's bumping along, and I do mean slow. I mean, I'm talking painfully, painfully slow. Let me pull that line off there. We're talking, tuck that thing in, that bait's down on the bottom, and you are just turning that handle. So painfully slow. This is not an exaggeration. I can't count how many clients have been on my boat. We go out and we throw a huddle center, another soft bait, and they catch a wintertime giant. And I ask them their, their thoughts at the end of the day and they all tell me the same thing. I have heard you say slow. I've heard you tell me to go even slower. I've heard you tell me to go even slower than I can imagine and then still slower. And I still had no idea how slow you meant. Tim and I, when we talk about crawling these baits, you can't turn that handle slow enough when the water is frigid. You know, 40s, 30s, when that water is cold, cold, ultra slow. It's just a giant meal down there on the bottom, just barely moving. Those bass can come in and they can inspect it and they're not wasting energy. They're just watching. It's right in front of them. And then it bumps into a rock and it shakes a little bit and it sends out that little startled signal and that bass just, just eats that bait. They just suck it in. And all too often, you'll be out there doing that, just slower than slow. And you're just dreaming because it's cold, you're uncomfortable, you haven't been bit yet, you're praying for the biggest bass of your life, but you don't know if it's coming. And all you feel is a thunk. You would think when you have a bait like this, you would think that there was just a freight train of a bite coming. Sometimes that's how it works out. Sometimes you're reeling that thing along and they stretch your arm so hard you mess up your elbow. But more often than not, especially the true giants, and for some of you that have missed some bites, this information might hurt, but usually the truly giant bass just feel like a tick. That's it. That was your giant swim bait bite. What I believe that is, is when a small fish comes up and they're looking at that thing and they wanna kill it, you know, a two pounder, three pounder, four pounder, five pounder, that's a big bait. They're not afraid to eat it, but they know that they need to win. So they tend to just, just kill that bait. They hit it as hard as they can and they pin it to the bottom. A giant bass, you guys have seen in our underwater footage over and over, the giant bass, when they open up that big mouth, the baits just vanish. Big baits are no different. That giant will be looking at that bait, it'll bump that rock, it'll shimmy, and they just open up and they suck that air. And when they do that, that bait vanishes inside that mouth and you feel their mouth shut. And you feel their lips on the line, tick, 
feels just like a jig bite. That, in my opinion, that's what's happening. Those truly giant fish have sucked that bait all the way in and you feel their mouth shut on the line, just like if they sucked in a jig. Just thunk, that's all you feel. If you feel that freight train, it's usually a smaller fish. So all of that is to say, be prepared for that softer bite. You don't have to wonder if it was a bite. It will feel like a bite. It'll be a clear thunk, they eat it. But it's not a hard, it's not a freight train most of the time. Boy, there is some boat traffic out here today. We got boats zipping all over the place. So, back to the bait. There are a handful of these wedge tail style baits. The Huddleston has worked remarkably for years. The Matlures is another great option. There are other companies coming out with new baits all the time. Down in the video description, I will link you the paddle tail style baits that we really like the hard baits that we really like, those cover glides, those reactive baits, and then wedge tails. Now, not all of the wedge tails are baits that I have even thrown because there's two or three brand new ones out there just this fall. But some of these baits are just remarkably reliable. I have all the faith in the world that these fish will eat them, you'll get that hook, and you'll get them in the boat. So we'll link all that for you down in the video description, you know, as well as how to rig some of these baits. But moving on, Let's talk gear, because gear is not glamorous, but it is essential when you're talking about big bait fishing. If you want to catch the biggest bass of your life on a swim bait this fall and winter, you need to be prepared. The reason why is that you can go out there, you can spend 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 dollars on a bait, and work and work and work out there in the freezing cold. Because did I mention they will work all winter long? Did I mention that you can be out there in 38 degree water and catch a 12 pound bass on a swim bait? It will work all winter long. Because you're out there doing that, putting in all that effort, if you go through all that work and you get that bite and you stick that fish and you don't have the right gear, and it comes off, what a bummer. I mean, you've done everything else right. So gear is critical. Now, if you're just getting into swim bait fishing, you're just dabbling, or you're on a budget, do what you can do. I'm not trying to make a guy ever put a rod on a credit card, ever. Don't ever, don't ever extend yourself beyond where you should be. But if you want to get into swim bait fishing, proper gear is really important to upping your odds of landing those fish. And the reason why is that the baits are heavy. So when they eat this bait and you stick a hook in them and that big old bass comes up thrashing, there's so much weight just in the swim bait. What these fish do is mind boggling. You'll see a fish come up. That thing is down their throat and they've got a hook in the roof of their mouth. And they'll come up and they'll, ju they'll jump. And this is what you see. You see just the nose. And they go down and they come up and jump again and all of a sudden you see this now you've got a head and a tail outside the mouth while they're jumping and they go down and they come up and jump again and next thing you see is this now the entire bait is outside the mouth and they're just barely skin hooked and the next time they come up out comes that bait it is devastating the key is to stick that hook and grind that fish as hard and as fast as you can turn the handle. I tell my clients, I do not care what position you end up in. When you set the hook, if you set to the side and you end up here, if you set up and you end up here, wherever you are, don't move the rod again. Crank and don't pump. This isn't salt water. There's way too much risk on the downstroke, when you pump and you come back down, that you'll create slack and they'll come off. You're much safer to swing and just grind and 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 grind, and grind until you get that fish. I got a jet ski running behind me. It's the middle of November. You gotta be kidding me. This guy doesn't know he could be catching a swim bait fish today. Back to gear. Proper gear is essential.
because you have to be able to plant that hook and you've got to be able to grind. I can't make this any more clear. If you're fighting a swim bait fish and you stop being able to turn the handle, you're not making progress. If you lock up, you are no longer in control. And a hundred percent of swim bait fish that are left to themselves will eventually come off. A hundred percent. The faster you get them to the boat, the higher your odds, higher and higher and higher your odds go of actually landing the fish. So you hit them and you grind and grind and grind. If they come up thrashing, don't stop reeling and just pull. Because if you're just pulling and they jump, you have nowhere left to go. They can unload the rod and they can get off. But as long as that handle's turning and you are always taking up line, it is much harder for them to create slack and win that fight. You just have to trust me on this. Monster bass can throw these baits if you don't go hard. I think I've emphasized that enough. So rods, reels, proper gear is essential. There are great budget options. That Dobbins Fury is a dynamite budget friendly swim bait rod. It's amazing that that is on the market. We used to use the Dobbins Champion, the one up from this exclusively for all of our hard bait fishing. It was the first true soft bait rod that would just load the boat with fish with no issues. And the Fury followed after. It's a dynamite budget option. Mid-range rods, high-end rods, there are so many good options. What everybody is looking for is that like do everything rod, a rod that can throw a soft bait, can throw a hard bait, and it's never existed. There's not a perfect rod. This one is as close as I have ever come. G Loomis 966. I throw all my hard baits, wake baits, glide baits, and most of my soft baits all on the same rod, which has really simplified my life. I have three of them that when I'm on a swim bait bite, I have these identical combos ready to go with my different baits. So even as I'm switching baits, my feel remains the exact same, which is a huge, huge advantage. That is a dynamite rod, but at any price point, there are phenomenal options on the market. It has really changed in the last few years. There's even great travel rods. Akuma has a dynamite travel rod that is within budget. Uh, it's not a really expensive rod. You keep it in your car and then you're always ready for a quick swim bait bite. The only other thing is line. I like to fish braid to leader. Uh, I believe, you know, there are pluses and minuses to everything. Mono, you've got tons of stretch, which helps absorb the fight, but you have tons of stretch, which makes it hard to stick the hooks, it makes it hard to feel the initial bite. Fluoro, it's better than mono because you have less stretch. It's easier to get that hook set. But fluorocarbon is, uh, it, you can have shock that really impacts that line. So you can shatter the line, literally just, just blow it up, shatter the line. Uh, and then not as sensitive as braid. Braided line is what I use for my swim bait fishing, but I use it with a leader. It's always in conjunction with a leader. I like to use heavy braid. All the people that you see arguing on forums and online about losing giant swim baits on braided line, don't understand braid. They use braid that is too light. So I use 65 pound at a minimum. I usually use 80 and sometimes I even use 100 because braided line is so thin that it doesn't matter. You can use 80 pound braid that's no thicker than a guy using 20 pound fluorocarbon. Why would you not do that? It's truly 80 pound breaking strength. So the advantages of braid are that you have unbelievably strong hook sets you can put an incredible amount of torque on the fish. Your sensitivity is amazing. Your downside is visibility and then backlashes. You can get some pretty nasty backlashes in braid, but at least you can pick them back out, which is nice. Uh, but the leader material on the end of that braid is the most important. I used to use all mono. I used Maxima 30 pound ultra green for all of it. In the last couple of years, you guys have seen me talk about that system leader, FC100. It's fluorocarbon, so I get the advantages of fluorocarbon. Uh, virtually invisible, right? A very, very clear line. But I get also the advantage of mono because FC100 was a saltwater line 
designed to stretch. It's a super stretchy fluorocarbon. So it's like a mono plus the advantages of fluoro. That's what I like to use for my swim bait fishing. Now I use most of the time I use either 30 or 35 pound. I even use 40 pound. That sounds crazy, right? It sounds crazy, but 40 pound is so thin. This line is extremely thin for what it says. You're rating 35 pound. It's very, very thin compared to a mono. So it might be the same thickness or a 20 or a 25 pound mono. So why not step up? It's just more insurance. Because when you are throwing those giant baits and you get a backlash, there's an incredible amount of torque that goes down that line, an incredible amount of shock, and it'll pop. But if you upsize your braid, upsize your leader, that won't be an issue. And then when you have those giant fish on, there is nothing better than sticking a fish, you're grinding, and you see the fish of a lifetime come up, you survive the jump, and you're grinding, and in your head, you know, I've got 80 pound line, and I've got 35 pound line. This fish is never going to break me off. I am winning this fight. The scariest thing in the world is when you stick that fish and you think, I have 20 pound fluoro and I don't remember the last time I re-spooled. Am I going to catch this fish? Pay attention ahead of time. Work on your gear, fine tune your gear, use the right equipment, use the best rod that you can afford, use quality line, replace it often, use quality baits, take your time, and during the winter, don't be afraid to go slower. Always slower. You can't go too slow to catch these fish. Last but not least, on all these soft baits, I am asking you to not add a treble hook on the belly. There's a hook hanger here. There's a hook hanger here. Please do not add a treble hook here. If you feel that you must have a treble hook, put it on the back. If you have to have one, we have taught videos on how to add stinger hooks and where to place them, right back here, if you have to. But if you just go out and fish at stock, most of them, especially the ones you want to catch, the big ones, they eat it whole. It's gone. You don't need that extra hook. But if you do feel the need, put it on the back because these giant fish are special. They are the fish of a lifetime. And it takes a very long time against unbelievable odds for them to grow in the first place. And when you catch that fish and you get it in the boat, you realize how magical that fish is. And all you can think about is getting a quality photo and a clean release. You want to know that that clean release was clean. You don't want to remember in the back of your mind that your belly treble was in her gills and you might have killed the fish of a lifetime. Don't do it. Put it on the back. Worst case, she'll be stuck in the back roof of the mouth and it is much safer for the fish. But with a jig hook and a proper rod, you can get 99% of those fish in the boat anyway. You don't even need a stinger. Guys, winter time is an amazing time. The lakes are typically empty. There aren't usually jet skiers. You have got to be kidding me. We have an amazing heat spell happening here right now, but before you know it, in a blink, it will be freezing cold again. Fish will eat swim baits. They will eat jigs. They will eat other slow moving baits. But this is one of the best times of year to catch that fish of a lifetime. If you're going to go to the lake and struggle for two or three or four or five finesse bites anyway. Now some lakes, that finesse bite's amazing. And if I was on one of those lakes and I could catch 20 or 30 fish a day in the winter, I would catch them. But if you're only gonna get a couple bites anyway, why not try to catch the biggest bass in the lake? Guys, I hope this video helps you. Down in the video description, I'll link all the gear for you to make it really simple. The gear that we trust and use every day, as well as rods at different price points that will make a difference for you. This is your time. Go out there, try to catch the biggest bass of your life. And if you do it, we wanna hear about it. If you have questions, leave them down there in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, hit that like button. 
subscribe to the channel, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.